Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back. I hope that you are fe feeling uh, ready to go and energized and prepared to begin our substantive discussion in this class, which is so interesting and, and so important. We're going to begin in kind of um, a general broad way where we touch on some research questions and some topics that are important in comparative political behavior. And we'll do it in a way where we begin with each topic area by kind of covering the evolution of, of the study of that, that particular question or that area. And of course, we're talking about voters and, and voter behavior and the various ways that they participate in politics. And as always, this is a, them a thematic discussion. So we'll do our very best to cover a lot of different country experiences and learn from a lot of different places. Of course, the US will play some role in this discussion because it is a democracy after all, and a very large one with a long tradition and a, a rich tradition and experience to learn from, albeit one that has its limitations like, like all others. So with that being said, um, let's go ahead and, and get started. Let me get situated here and share my screen. So if you were paying attention in November, you no doubt saw photos like this with long lines at polling stations, people wearing masks, uh, huddled together, but socially distancing and um, waiting for sometimes hours and hours to cast their votes. Now, this was in addition to record numbers of, of mail-in votes and mail-in ballots that were cast. And turnout in general in that election was, was very high for, for US standards. And so it was an interesting and notable election, not just because of the turnout, but, but also because of these sorts of images. And it begs the question, you know, why were, were people so willing to vote and why were they willing to wait so long to vote? Maybe more importantly, was there something that motivated them that, that kept them in line or that that prevented them from going home when maybe they decided that it was it was just too much to bear, especially when they risked the possibility of of uh, contracting the virus. Before we continue, does anyone want to comment on why people remained so uh, dedicated to the process despite all the risks and despite how costly it was for many people to wait in lines like this? I think it had a lot to do with what people thought was at stake in this election. Um, they could see how the country had changed so much within the last four months between the pandemic, let alone the past four years, and recognize how important it was to have leaders in charge of the federal, state, and local governments that truly represented them in the values that they wanted and wanted to make sure that they were participating in the process that chose those people. So what Ishan is capturing here is a sort of performance perspective or the idea that voters go to the polls and vote the way they do because they want to hold the government accountable for some performance failure or they care about some uh, outcome that they think a new government might might bring about. This is very much about how voters assess the capacity of the incumbent government to handle the, the current circumstances, right? So it really actually paints a very sophisticated picture of the average voter. They're assessing information about the performance of the government. They're thinking about the alternatives um, and they're accepting the risks involved because they, they ultimately feel um, the need or or they feel like it's incumbent upon them to hold the government accountable or to act on that performance criterion that, that is so important for them. That's a very important perspective that will come up in the class over and over again. And that's one among many perspectives. Um, do we have any other comments or ideas on why people were willing to wait so long to vote? Um, and especially considering the risks of, 
of contracting the virus. Um, I think people wanted to see change. They wanted to make their voice heard. And I mean, it being a really crazy year and they're just, they wanted to make their voice heard and see a change. And they knew that they had to go out and vote and do something about it. They needed to take action. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe they felt very motivated by, by a sense of urgency, right? By maybe the crises that are unfolding. And I'm sorry, did I interrupt someone there? Oh yeah, hi. Go ahead, Virginia. Yeah, so I've been a poll worker since 2016. So I kind of saw how like the demographics changed because the majority of people who actually went in from where I was like was a combination between like from 2016, it used to be like a much more older demographic. But when this new, when this election came around, I saw a lot of younger people and a lot of much more like minorities, you know, more people who are like, you know, different ages and so it like showed that you know there was a lot more at stake than what people felt like earlier and like the amount of people coming in to turn in their ballots was a lot as well and just the amount of people who were like willing to wait many people had masks many people who actually listened to us versus like how it used to be in 2016 when a lot more people felt the need to just kind of blow it off Thank you so much for your perspective, Virginia. That's really interesting and so useful for us to hear your, your insight as a poll worker. And especially considering that you said you've done this since 2016. So you've kind of seen um, before and during the pandemic. And really, it sounds like you've, you've sort of been at the game for, for some time and maybe have seen like the, the situation kind of around the time when the new admi administration came in and then up to the present where it's now leaving. I really thought it was interesting how you highlighted that the people who seem to come out in larger numbers are disproportionately young people and in minorities. Those are precisely the people who have really the biggest stake and the most to lose. Um, they could potentially benefit a great deal from policy changes uh, and the resolution and the management of the crises that we face, political, economic, and social. They also um, have long been less involved in politics, right? So that was a coalition or a constituency that could be mobilized and, and was effectively by a lot of, of grassroots people um, and leaders and, and community leaders. And so these are a lot of really important factors that we take into consideration when we think about voting behavior and what motivates people. Well, from our perspective so far, it sounds like people are driven to hold incumbent governments accountable for performance failures, to, to hold governments accountable or to bring about or try to bring about uh, the election of governments and leaders who might resolve crises. And then people might be especially motivated to vote uh, if they are from constituencies who are, who are disproportionately impacted by, by crises. And, and those people are young people in minorities and in and really minorities and young people um, in that order. These are groups then that become especially important in campaigns, in politics and elections into parties. Parties will target these groups um, and they will try to understand what motivates people and gets them to the polls. And so our starting point is thinking about this simple puzzle. You know, why do people vote? And why do they vote under difficult circumstances? And why do they vote when it could potentially be very uh, costly to them uh, down the road and in ways that they can't foresee? We have a lot of contributions in the chat. So I'm gonna go ahead and check these out. Claudia says, can we talk about how it is definitely great that these people waited so long to vote, uh, but that it is also a form of voter suppression? Absolutely, and, and this is totally true. These are the people who won the election for the Democratic Party in, in, in all sorts of important places, including Georgia. And they did so in spite of, of record voter suppression, especially in Georgia. And so that is, that is certainly part of the conversation. We're not uh, dismissing or, or neglecting that in, in any way. We're simply addressing the sort of more fundamental question of, of maybe, and maybe more importantly, I think what you add is that is that even despite all those efforts to suppress them, people still vote. Um, and maybe then the question takes on added urgency, which is, well, what, dr what drives them despite maybe the, the sense or the suspicion that they're being held down 
um, unfairly. And, and maybe then the question becomes especially important for us. Arlene says, but voting by mail was also an option. So it wasn't more of a personal choice that they were waiting so long, so long. Perhaps it was, but but still, I think that it's it's relevant to consider that they could have stayed home and they could have chosen to not participate at all, uh, and they certainly didn't. And there are some some requirements that some people have a difficult time meeting if they if they want to to vote by mail. Only some places, only Nevada, if I'm not mistaken, sent everyone uh, a ballot by mail, and so it, it's not always as accessible as we might like to think. So I think people are <clears throat> willing to wait so long to vote. Um, specifically in this picture, I see groups. So I see couples, I see friends. Um, and uh, I think that's, and I like how you said, hold accountable. And you were talking about like representatives and, and political figures and actors, but I mean, you know, I try to hold my brother accountable and say, hey, man, like we registered you to vote that one time. How about you vote this time? And he's inconsistent with voting. So it's important to hold your family, your friends, your neighbors, everybody accountable to to be heard because they're the same people you have to listen to when something's going awry in your social network. Definitely. So there's there's a, a kind of social relation, a kind of role for family in other relationships and connections. This is something that comes from the literature as well. There is a role for social networks. And in particular, when it comes to registering new voters and getting people into, into politics, that's a really difficult nut to crack. And so families and people with a close relationship to, to someone who might be, be mobilizable, if we, if we, can, say, if we can say that, are usually the best ones to speak to those individuals. And this is something that comes from the literature that we'll see in, in a limited way in this class. Um, we have a lot of activity here in the chat. I'm gonna keep a close eye on it. So Alondra says, some individuals believe it's their duty to participate in politics, not actually do something they want to do. Right, so some people may feel like it's not a, it's not a choice, it's actually a responsibility or there's a, a convention or, or, or a role that they must fill, uh, such as voting. Claudia says, I think that a lot of the voter turnout was due to the, the coverage of the consequences of this election. Look at Jim Clyburn and Stacey Abrams, especially in voter outreach. Also think back to the BLM protests in the summer, people felt drawn to make their voices heard despite the risks. I believe there could be a casual low risk, low level risk benefit analysis going on morally. Also, social media made politics much more palatable for everyone. So people were paying much more attention than usual, says Brittany. There's a lot of agreement with that point. Uh, Hargoon says, people vote based on benefits versus costs. And in this particular election, there was so much uncertainty in the world that the cost of voting was higher than typically. Okay, good. So we're really keying into some important points here about the, the, the relative importance of a sense of duty versus a cost benefit analysis in a, in a choice made based on an assessment of the potential for gain or, or for loss if the incumbent government remains in power uh, versus uh, the alternative that you might favor or, or someone else replacing them. And this gets me to, to something that I want to address here momentarily, but I, I wanna first step back for a moment and just give you um, a couple different examples of, of similar types of events where people waited in long lines to vote. And, and one very good example is, is the first all race elections in South Africa in April, 1994. And on this day, April 27th, black South Africans waited in very long lines at polling stations to vote. And, and it was a similar situation. And of course, we can probably more readily see the stakes in this case. Uh, this was a, an incredible, important moment for South Africa and for Black South Africans. This signified uh, emancipation, in a sense, and enfranchisement politically, because it, it signified the end of apartheid and the sort of beginning of a process of reconciliation and the incorporation 
fully of, of Black South Africans. And so this was a moment that was worth waiting for, uh, clearly. And the sense of the importance and the potential for gain was extraordinary. And indeed, in this election, uh, Nelson Mandela was elected. And of course, he represented the, the Black African Union. And this was a, an important outcome for Black South Africans. And it, it further cemented and sort of uh, consolidated those gains that they had already won through through the vote and through in, in being enfranchised. So this is an example of, of waiting in line uh, based on that perception that there's there's really a, a great potential for gain and, and for, for change and for participating in politics in a meaningful way. Arlene says, could the reason also be that people have more time on their hands since many workplaces had to close either early in the day or, or close completely due to COVID? Yeah, it's possible. It's certainly possible. In a lot of countries, uh, Arlene and others, voting is a, a national holiday. Election day is a holiday for this reason, because people can vote more easily if they're given the day off and they don't have to wrangle that from their employer. In the US, it's not the case. In, in this instance, maybe more people had the day off. And certainly that could have had a role, uh, a role to play, um, something I hadn't thought of. And it's, it's certainly the case that a lot of people had the day off because of the crisis that we're in. So, so this is the, the South African case, but it's an, an example of what people are willing to wait for. Let's take an, another example, the, the case of Central African Republic in 2015. Now this is a, a interesting case because it was the first set of elections after a period of civil conflict and uh, authoritarian rule. The elections themselves had been delayed, but they were ultimately peaceful. And there's a great uh, video here that I want to show you that I wasn't able to download. So we're going to go ahead and open this and um, take a look. Just a minute here. Oui, je suis très ému par rapport euh, au taux des votants qui sont afflués devant les bureaux de vote pour faire remplir en tout cas leur, leur devoir de citoyenneté. Nous, on espère euh, un vote transparent et un vote légitime. Et pour le moment, ça va, bon, à part quelques petits problèmes de administratif là, qu'on est en train de régler rapidement, mais sinon dans l'ensemble, je pense que l'ambiance est bon enfant. Bon, et puis on espère que tout va se passer, bon, enfin, correctement. Il y a des longues piles de cœur et, et je crois que, que c'est ce que nous pouvons retenir, qu'il y a beaucoup de gens, donc ça veut dire que les Sénateurs veulent tourner une page sombre, triste. Moi, je vais à ces élections pour rassembler les Sénateurs, pas pour les diviser. Et s'il y a un maximum de compatriotes qui trouvent que dans notre programme, il y a des réformes qu'on peut apporter à leur solution, à leur situation. Demain, ensemble, dans l'unité et dans l'esprit de réconciliation et de paix, et d'engagement vers la paix, euh, cela est positif pour notre pays. Donc, je pense que ça fait un peu de temps depuis ce matin à démarrer, mais au fur et à mesure, les problèmes sont résolus. L'essentiel est que les problèmes soient résolus et que le maximum de centres de vote. Je note un grand engouement, vous savez, euh, quand on voit les queues un peu partout, on sent que les Centrafricains veulent euh, euh, voter. Et il faut leur donner l'opportunité de le faire. Les dysfonctionnements sont un peu normaux, mais bon, au fur et à mesure, il faut qu'ils soient plus. Très fier même. Bon, si par exemple aujourd'hui, s'il n'y a pas de vote là, on ne peut pas être libre. Quoi. Si on a voté, on est maintenant libre. Tout le monde est en joie. One of my gardeners came and 
so after seeing some of these examples in hearing about the different reasons that people go to the polls and why they turn out to vote, and after seeing examples in both developing and, and advanced countries, the US on the one hand, South Africa secondarily, and then even the Central African Republic, the question and the puzzle remains, you know, why people vote and more importantly, maybe why they will wait in long lines to vote or why they will potentially um, delay other things in their life to vote. And it may seem obvious and maybe it is the case that they feel they have a duty or maybe they feel like the potential gain is considerable, but it still is worth considering and worth thinking about, you know, truthfully, a, a truly rational person might decide that it's not worthwhile leaving the house. Uh, and maybe a rational person would decide otherwise, but I'd like us to stop for a moment and think about this. And so what I'm gonna do is create a quick poll um, that addresses this issue of, of waiting in line to vote and, and why people vote, because this helps us to begin to think about the key issues in the class and one of the earliest questions and debates uh, in the literature, which is, why people vote and, and how to understand voter behavior. All right, everyone, I've launched a poll and I'd like you to take a moment and think about this. And in a second, we'll step back and assess the results and sort of put them next to some of the insights from the literature that will help to frame our study of the key questions in the course. Pretty interesting results so far. Share them here in a moment when everyone's done. 88% of the vote is in. I think it's pretty much decided. The AP would call it at this point. Only four of you have yet to vote. 81% or 51 of you seem to think that this has to do with the potential for gain. 12 of you or 19% of you say that it is it is one's duty. Four of you still have yet to vote, so we'll we'll wait just a moment to see if if the remaining four voters are are out there and would like to join us. But I, I'll cut it off here in a moment, and I'll share the results in a second um, when it looks like we have got all the participation that we can get. Well, I think that this one is over, so I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and I'm gonna share the results. So take a look at the results, everyone. It's a pretty decisive victory for, they think the potential for gain outweighs the cost. So what that me tells me is that, you know, the, the, the vast majority of you, a super majority of you think that for the most part, voters are driven by a, a logic of, of, of a calculus, right? They calculate the costs and benefits of voting and they, they act based on their perception of the potential cost or benefit of a new administration or the incumbent government being reelected. And that's a very charitable view of voters that you have because it suggests that, that you see voters as very capable and sophisticated, fully informed, able to assess different alternatives, uh, think about and identify their interests. These are some of the assumptions that go into this perspective that emphasizes sort of the rational choice calculation component of voting behavior. Now, those of you or the 12 of you or the 19% of you who said that they feel like it is their duty, you're seeing the world more in terms of sort of the, the social convention or the institutional role of voting, right? 
the perception people have that it is their duty or their their obligation or that there's a sort of expectation or a norm that, that they must comply with right they must meet that that logic of of of, of acceptance and and that logic of, of right and upstanding behavior in the community. And that behavior might be further condoned and, and sort of regularized if the country has compulsory voting laws, which are the, the case in, in many countries. For example, I th I'm, if I'm not mistaken in Argentina, they have compulsory voting laws, so you, you have to vote. And in Australia, they do as well. That certainly can contribute to the to the sense people might have that it is their duty to vote. Take a look at the chat here. It's quite a bit of. Um... Oh yes, uh, I forgot to put answer C. I'm I'm sorry about that. But my my feeling is I think that people might still have said that um, it was B. That they still think that it was probably largely. A, a logic of of calculus or or sort of calculating costs and benefits. Kyrie says not every demographic benefits from the privilege of voting, though. This is absolutely correct, and we're sensitive to this, and that's why we acknowledge, for example, that that's probably why young people and minorities voted in larger numbers than ever before and showed the biggest increase in their in their turnout in this election because they were disproportionately affected by the crises that we face and moreover they don't actually benefit as much from the status quo as other groups and so they depend especially on change in progress and improve and improvements in policy and in better representation so we're not saying or assuming that every group benefits equally from, from voting. In fact, it's far from the case. No democracy is perfect. That's why we call them polyarchies. In fact, in no democracy can all voting age adults even vote. And, and so there are many limitations. Um, we acknowledge that, but sort of in a kind of hypothetical world, you know, accepting and, and acknowledging those, those, limit, those limits, we still can engage in this sort of analysis where we think about, well, are voters anticipating a net improvement in their situation? Um, or are they thinking more in terms of what is incumbent upon them and, and, and a logic of, of normative right behavior? Claudia says, I agree, but we also have to recognize that those who have been the most impressed by the government face more voter suppression uh, and may feel like it isn't worth it to vote. This is true, but they, they also might feel like there's even greater potential for gain if they're able to change the, the, the system. And so there are two ways of looking at it, right? You can, you can choose to opt out and, bo and boycott the system, or you can choose to participate from within and try to reform it from within. And, and those are, 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 are alternatives that are available to us. And we don't necessarily have to choose one of them. We can try both, um, but they are equally valid. And, and you know, these institutions don't create and change themselves. Oftentimes we have to be the impetus. And Stacey Abrams <clears throat> in Georgia is a good example if we want to talk about individuals who single-handedly or, or, you know, not single-handedly, but, but very effectively act alone to begin a movement that, that helps to change politics in a significant way. Yeah, so, so Hargan says, well, maybe you can conceive of, of, a, of duty as being a benefit. I know, Claudia says, I know a lot of marginalized groups were, were, were voting um, between, between evils and choosing the lesser of evils. How democratic is that? So we're not we're not saying that it's 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 dem it's democratic and and frankly that's how voters usually decide um, they make a decision based on uh, their perception of of the, the likelihood of a loss or how they would be how they would be affected and they choose the the alternative that would be better for them and if that means they would incur the smallest loss or if they would incur the largest benefit it effectively is the same thing right. <clears throat> 
they're making a decision based upon what would be best for them given the alternatives available to them. And so we're not, we're not making a statement that it's democratic or not, and it very well might not be. And voter suppression is very, very real, and it exists in many places, not just the United States. Um, and so we, we are acknowledging that, but in this instance, we're engaging in sort of an analytical exercise where we're just trying to think about the choices that people make and why they would make those choices. We're not, we're not evaluating how democratic they are at this stage, although that is important and we will do that. So there's a lot of really good um, discussion in the chat and I uh, applaud that and, and I appreciate that you're vigorously engaging these issues. This is what it's about, right? Because when voters decide, they're thinking about all these issues and these considerations, right? It is true that, that Joe Biden was cozy with, with segregationists and that's a reality that is chilling uh, for myself and for many. Um, and, and we have to be you know, straightforward about that. These are things that go into the choices that people make and whether they support or don't support parties and elections. And I think then if we acknowledge that, that in that regard, um, you know, Joe Biden may have been undesirable to many, well, then you're comparing Joe Biden to, to, to Donald Trump. And from that perspective, seeing it from that perspective through that lens, we can understand it as, the, as choosing the lesser of two evils, without a doubt. But that also goes to what was said previously about how voters decide often based upon um, a sense of averting a potential loss, right? They vote based on what will avert a loss, not necessarily what will bring a benefit, but both of those are effectively the same thing. What will be the better outcome for me based upon you know, my evaluation of the costs and the benefits of the different alternatives? So there's another question here that is a little bit different, but that is equally important. And this is the question of the context. When we talk about comparative political behavior, we're actually not just talking about the United States. And in fact, the US is often studied on its own when it comes to political behavior within American politics. But when we compare the US to other countries in other contexts, it does become comparative. So, what you'll notice is that voters in both the Central African Republic in 2015 and the example that I gave you, and the United States in 2020 waited in long lines to vote. But these circumstances and these contexts are clearly very, very different despite these small similarities. And what the more general question is, how are questions of political participation different in emerging democracies and in non-democratic countries? And then how do those differences bear on political participation and how do political behavior and voting and, and other forms of, of political activity reflect those, those differences? Does anyone want to comment on what makes the context different in an emerging democracy or even a non-democratic country? <clears throat> Can you repeat the question? Sorry. Yeah, no, it's just this question here. How are questions of political participation different in emerging democracies and in non-democratic countries as compared to say the United States? So I would actually say that political participation, whether it be through voting or even through demonstrations or grassroots movements, there's more at stake and I think it means more in emerging democracies and especially in non-democratic countries because often if you're going against like the majority view or um, the view of um, the view that the government has there's often going to be more repercussions whereas in like an established democracy it's not common to face like death or like imprisonment for doing certain things, like acting out of line. 
Yeah, that's a that's a really good point, Claudia. So like in Egypt, for example, there's been a lot of repression since the reversal of democracy that that has occurred since about the early 2010s after the initial transition to democracy. And a lot of the pro-democracy movements have been repressed viciously. That's an example of how a sort of reversal of democracy and a return to authoritarian rule can be very, very uh, fateful and, and perilous for those who, who might oppose authoritarianism. Now, in the, the case of the Central African Republic, they were trying to turn the page on a period of civil conflict and authoritarian rule as well. And there's always that palpable fear that if you're not successful in sort of defeating the incumbent sort of establishment <clears throat> movement, that there will be a reversal and a return to authoritarian rule and you might be viciously repressed uh, and maybe even exiled for having participated or, or promoted or, or been a part of democracy movements. And so the elections become really, really meaningful and the stakes become extraordinarily significant when there's the potential for democratic progress uh, and also the potential for democratic reversal. And so Central Africa illustrates that in a way that the, Uni the United States alone could not illustrate because even in the US where we have a very contested and controversial and important election, there is never really a serious question of a sort of de descent into, into authoritarian rule. Now, to be clear, the institutions have been tested recently and there was a very um, sort of uh, flaccid effort to overturn the democratically held and conducted election and, and it, it wasn't successful and it showed the resilience of the institutions. Uh, but the, the point here is that this is a, a situation that is very different in the Central African Republic in 2015, or in Chile in, in 1990, uh, or in Ecuador in 1979, and so on and so forth. All of these contexts where the election wasn't just a moment to elect a government, it was also a moment to sort of cement and catalyze and, and advance democracy. So this is why developing democracies take on added importance when it comes to elections and voting behavior and, and participation. And I pulled a quote from the reading that I assigned that I thought very nicely highlights this. And that quote is, in new democracies, the challenge is to engage the citizenry in meaningful participation after years of ritualized engagement or actual prohibitions on participation. And I'll go much, much further. I think that the reading didn't do a good job of highlighting an additional reality, which is that that the, the sort of future of democracy in the future of the country does hang in the balance. And there does need to be a decisive electoral outcome, a defeat of the incumbent regime, uh, a sort of uh, decisive election of a, of a very pro-democratic movement. And when I say the, the defeat of the incumbent regime, what I mean is, is moving away from that that constituency or that side of the equation that, that still associates with the past regime. And so there are some important differences between developing and advanced democracies. And so throughout the course, we'll be distinguishing between the experiences of these different types of democracies and these different categories of democracies. And you'll see that there are nuances and, and, and little wrinkles to the story that make their experiences unique. Um, and those are really interesting, especially when we get to, to places like Latin America, where despite similarities to the US in the way the systems are set up, uh, elections and behavior are, are, very, are very different creatures. Let me take a look at the chat and see what we have here. Uh, many of you have said um, it's the, the, the game has changed and Biden is a racist. No, I agree, he's not racist. Um, and the game has changed without a doubt, but it's also true that he did cozy up to, to those, those folks back in the day. And it wasn't necessarily something that everyone in politics did and everyone in the Democratic Party did. So, you know, we just need to you know, keep it real about his origin. And it is true that many of his advantages and his leadership qualities uh, come from years and years in politics. And so it's difficult to say on the one hand, oh, oh, he's, um, he's so unacceptable for these reasons, 
when on the other hand, we say, well, we, we like him because of his many years of leadership. So it's complicated. We can walk and chew gum at the same time, uh, without a doubt. And, and um, you know, I, I don't, you know, I don't see any issue in, 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 um, in us taking a nuanced approach, right? And in, in being realistic about that. But he was also an important part of, of the administration that saw the election of the first uh, black president. And, and you know, there are differing views on, on his role in that administration and his political role in the campaign and, and who he appealed to. Um, but he's certainly one who retains the support of a large, a large majority of black Americans. And I, I, I'm not at all surprised because he, he has consistently since um, really represented uh, those, those communities. And, and so it's complicated, everyone. People in politics have histories, just like people out of politics have histories. There's a lot of interesting conversation here. Um, good to see that we're engaging and in, in, in participating. <laughs> Okay, now speaking of participation in non-democratic contexts, this is Russia and in Russia, they have what we would refer to as sort of a competitive authoritarian regime. It's not really a democracy. It's not really a full dictatorship. They don't have entirely competitive elections, although they're competitive enough that it's always possible that Putin will be defeated they have tight limits on liberties and, and freedoms that we take for granted here. And, and so democratic participation is, is very curtailed in many respects and public protest and demonstrations are tightly constrained and tightly controlled. And that's what we see here in this image. So in a place like Russia, assuming that it becomes more democratic, democratic elections become meaningful and are important because they're times and periods when it becomes important to promote participation and protest and all sorts of displays in activities and in roles and types of participation in politics that previously were were more tightly constrained and this is why the meaningfulness of participation is associated with elections i think that i interrupted someone i'm sorry did you want to make a comment yeah, sorry. Um, Professor, is it possible for like um, developing countries to also like the lack of participation from um, citizens is because like they feel like their vote won't, there's so much corruption in a, a country that their vote, vote won't really do anything. So they just, they just don't, not, not in like the fear of being like um, killed or anything, but just the, the feel like they probably feel like their vote won't do anything because there's so much corruption in the country. Is that possible for like lower participation? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, a lot of elections in authoritarian systems, they're just rigged. The results are made up. There are fantastic stories about like election administrators in corrupt dictatorships who release the results of the election accidentally like a day before the election is held. And it becomes clear to everyone that the whole thing was rigged from the start. You know, it's not it's not like statistically possible for anyone to win 96% of the vote. You know, you can imagine it maybe, but realistically, like politically, it's just not really possible. I guess statistically it could be possible, but politically it's not. And so in a lot of dictatorships, it's well known and understood that elections aren't meaningful. And even if they aren't rigged per se, they're not competitive in the sense that the incumbent government doesn't face um, a viable competition, or maybe they are able to hand pick who they run against and in that way, dramatically limit the, the likelihood that they'll be removed uh, through, through the election. And so when we talk about it not being meaningful, that's, that's what we mean. A, a lot of people don't feel like it really means anything for them to go to the polls and so they don't vote. And so in Venezuela, for instance, uh, although there still is a lot of popular support for the, the socialist Maduro administration, the opposition movement in the party in the Congress uh, frequently boycotts elections. They just don't vote. The reason is because they're 
decrying how how flawed and irregular and rigged those elections and those races have become. Uh, and so, yeah, it is common. And that's why it becomes important and why we strive for meaningful elections in a new democracy. That's why you'll see that over and over, how to create meaningful elections as opposed to just elections, because anyone can have elections. You can have them anywhere and everywhere. And in fact, sometimes dictatorships have more of them than democracies because they try in every way that they can to legitimate themselves. And so they try to, to, to mobilize popular support. But real meaningful democratic elections are free, fair, frequent and, and fair. And, and they involve a meaningful participation of, of a variety of different kinds and, and not like what you see here. Now, I'm gonna take a look at the chat here. I feel like there's um, quite a debate here or maybe something. Claudia says, is the term electoral authoritarianism outdated? Sort of, because I think a better term and maybe what is meant by that is competitive authoritarianism. A competitive authoritarian regime is one where there are elections that are more or less competitive. There's a realistic possibility that the incumbent government might lose but it's still an uneven playing field and the incumbent government abuses its power in a way that, that um, erodes basic, basic qualities of a democracy. It might be a little outdated. I, I don't know, I don't know. I think it's still used, but I think competitive authoritarianism is more specific. I was just wondering, cause I took a comparative uh, politics class last year and that's the word that was used to describe um, Russia, basically. So I just wanted to know what term is like more commonly used nowadays. Yeah, no, that's that's good to know. I think the competitive authoritarian regime is probably more common, especially since Putin keeps holding relatively competitive elections and in, in, in still winning them. So yeah, good question, though. Thank you. Virginia says you guys should put name in your in the numbers. Uh, yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, cause it's still hard to know a lot of agreement there. Okay, cool. So we're not quite done, um, with this substantive unit, but we will continue for the, the remainder of this, this two minutes and where this gets us this discussion that we've had so far about the relative importance of the logic of appropriateness in the, the sense of duty and the calculation, the cost benefit analysis that voters engage in. Do voters vote because they're compelled to out of the sense of duty or because they're driven by self-interest in the, the, the potential for gain? This discussion, in this discussion moreover of the differences between developing and advanced democracies it gets us to the four areas of debate on political behavior across these different categories of, of countries and sort of that are infused with these different perspectives on voting. And the first one regards mass political behavior, attitudes, beliefs, and abilities. This is really maybe one of the oldest, if not the oldest, areas of research in comparative political behavior. The key, the key questions have always been, you know, what do people know about politics? How much do they know about the actual political process and what they're choosing or making a decision about? And to what degree do they bring their knowledge to bear on, on, on politics and in elections in, in a way that is, is useful and effective? And do their voter attitudes and beliefs are they consistent with their interests or with what might promote their interest? And does their behavior seem to be consistent with, with those interests? This school of research is, is really the oldest one of all. And it's a research area that has evolved considerably because of how the views of the ordinary voter have changed. It used to be the case that voters were held in relatively low regard, and they were thought of as unsophisticated and 
lacking basic knowledge and really unqualified to make decisions. Increasingly, that's not the view that we have. Research seems to suggest that voters are much savvier, the more sophisticated and capable of using their knowledge in, in making effective decisions um, in a variety of circumstances. This research we will take on in the class and we'll learn about and engage in the class. And we'll deal with other questions that pertain to, the, to mass behavior and attitudes and beliefs and abilities. But one of the most important starting points is this question of the, the abilities or the knowledge of voters. And this does actually conclude our lecture for today. We're out of time. As usual, I've gone a little bit over. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording. Thank you very much, everybody, for being here and for participating. Um, I thought that you had a very lively uh, engagement and, and we're really very much a part of this. Thanks so much for that. I hope you have a nice weekend. I'll post the rest of the readings and uh, I'll see you on Monday. Also, come see me during office hours if you want. I'll be there today for an hour and a half. All right, see ya. Thank you, Thank Professor. You, Professor. Thank you, Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great weekend. You too.